Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. For the, the third time in less than 24 hours, I have the pleasure of introducing Ben. More than 24 hours. Oh, no, less no, than 24 hours. No, less than 24 hours. hours. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Amazing. I'm not going to repeat it. Ben's done great stuff. We're happy he's here. Go do it. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. All right. So I want to tell you very briefly. <laughs> I want to tell you very briefly about Helios, which is uh, a web-based truly verifiable voting system that I've been working on for a little while now. And the first question you should say, you should ask after this talk I gave this morning is, web-based? <laughs> and you should be very, very skeptical of this. Uh, but the reasoning is as follows. Many elections are happening already on the web. I don't mean things like municipal elections or governmental elections. I mean a lot of club elections, student government elections, all sorts of little elections that people are running. And the online elections are the least auditable of all. Because with a paper election, you can actually watch the ballot box, right? With, with, even without any crypto, you can sit there and watch the ballot box. With an online election, you can't even do that. You can do nothing. I mean, you are literally just shipping your ballot into the ether and then a, a day later, somebody says, Bob won. And you say, OK, great. I mean, I think, right? There's nothing that links your vote to the result. So there's all these little elections happening, and they have zero verifiability. So there's an opportunity here for a clear win, right? We can talk about the, the pros and cons of cryptography in governmental elections. And there are some cons, the potential cryptographic uh, compromise of your privacy and such. In the online web setting, it's almost 100% a win that you're just going to get a better system. So maybe it's an interesting place to do more prototyping to get people used to the concept of having a receipt when they vote, which is a, a new concept that they have to get used to. And to start to have uh, a, a population that's, that's educated in the idea of these truly verifiable voting systems. And if the entire Facebook generation which is more people on Facebook than there are in the US, right? If, there, if the entire Facebook population votes for Facebook group leaders using a, verify, a truly verifiable system, then maybe we have a chance of eventually having us, us vote for president using one of these systems. Not this system, right? Not Helios web-based, but maybe a stronger version of Helios or Scantegrity 2 or something else like that. So that's the idea. Um, I have a typo here in the last point I added just before. <laughs> there is a risk. We have to be careful about the risk. People will think that web-based voting is OK for all elections, apparently. Mm -hmm. Elections. <laughs> yeah. So th that is a risk. And we have to be careful about that. And there are some, some organizations that are considering possibly using Helios where that is a particular concern. Um, I don't want to downplay that concern. We have to, we have to always, uh, when we're pitching Helios, we always have to emphasize. This is appropriate for some elections. It's not appropriate for all elections. And uh, that's another important argument in general. Not every election should use the same system, necessarily. So in particular, one strong assumption that Helios makes is that your election is going to be low coercion. Low coercion meaning there's, a small ch there's not a large chance that somebody wants to pay you money to vote a certain way. You know the kind of clubs where people would probably need to get paid to run instead of paying to, to run. You know, that, those kinds of elections are perfect for a web-based election system. Or potentially, um, things, elections where when you go home, the other people in your home, you might care about the election, but the other people in your home really don't care. Like if you are a university student and you go home to uh, friends or family that are not at your university, you might really care about who gets elected, but you're close private family members just don't care. So they're not going to coerce you one way or the other. But these, these little situations, there's a whole bunch of them where um, maybe you're, there's just no chance you're going to get coerced. And I think that's an opportunity to try some of these concepts to see if they work. So Helios uses the concepts I described earlier today, probabilistic encryption and threshold decryption, posting all of the encryptions on a website. 
uh, probabilistic, I think I called it randomized encryption <coughs> this morning. That's what I mean there. It uses homomorphic tallying, the magic adding under the covers of encryption. It does not use mixed nets. An early version of the system used mixed nets, but it turned out that it seemed easier in the case of Helios and a little easier to explain to talk about homomorphic tallying. That means no write-ins. Um, and that's just one of the limitations of Helios. There are no write-ins in Helios, which has cost us a couple of last-minute cancellations the night before an election when somebody said, oh, could you add write-ins <laughs> like before we launched the election? The answer is no, not, not because I don't want to, but because I couldn't do it if I had three weeks to do it. It, 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 just, it just doesn't support that. Um, it uses the Benelow challenge, the caster audit mechanism, whereby uh, as a voter, you're probably not, you're just going to go and vote, but an auditor can go in and try to break open the ballot to make sure the machine, the booth, did the right thing. And I'll show you that. Uh, and it uses in-browser encryption. So uh, what that means is we're actually doing the encryption of your ballot in browser JavaScript and Java. So there's your, the plain text of your ballot is never going over the network. You can, in fact, take your browser offline when you're making your selections, which is kind of cool. So I'll show you that, too. Uh, just to remind you, because I think it's a key part of this, the Benelow challenge is the idea that you're going to choose something, you're going to get an encrypted ballot, and at that point the machine doesn't know whether you're going to break it open or whether you're going to cast it. And it's that uncertainty that forces the machine to do the right thing or else it risks getting caught. So this is important. You don't need to trust that Helios is encrypting your ballot properly. You have a way of checking. If you like a few system details, uh, Helios on the back end is implemented entirely in the Python programming language. In the client, it's JavaScript logic and crypto with just the lowest level uh, of math implemented in Java because we just can't do it fast enough in JavaScript. It's free open source. You can go download it right now. It's deployed and running on Google App Engine. Uh, and it, can, is also, it was also deployed on uh, Apache, Python, and Postgres, sort of a fully open source stack for the, one of the elections that we ran, the one in Belgium. And now, as of the version that I'm going to demo today, it's customizable in its authentication, which is the key issue, right? When you're doing one of these online elections, how do you authenticate as a voter? Well, in the system I'll show you today, you can authenticate with your Facebook account or with your Twitter account. Those are the two easy examples that uh, we put together. But you, it's been integrated with the Princeton University login system. It, it, we're talking about potentially integrating with the, the Harvard University login system. Uh, and the idea is that the code is now modular enough to do that in a way that's generic. So it's easier to customize to any one particular authentication system. Does it work? Well, there are two use cases I want to tell you about very briefly. The Université Catholique de Louvain, which had 25,000 eligible voters, 5,000 of whom voted. Um, that means there are actually that many people voting for the president of a university. It's kind of a cool little situation there. That used Helios 2.0, uh, which was optimized for that particular use case, translated to French, uh, improved user interface where they tested it locally. Uh, sadly, because they did it in French, obviously, uh, some of those improvements were not immediately rolled back into Helios 3.0, which is the version I'll demo today. So what that means is if you're a user of Helios 3.0, it's you know, 90% better and 10% worse, basically. Um, and it was recently used, Helios 3.0, in the Princeton University undergraduate government in November. Uh, 5,000 eligible voters, 1,500 votes, and an authentication integration with the Princeton authentication system. Uh, and the really interesting story about the university elections is that they usually, it, it, there's a couple of universities that have come to us and talked about integrating Helios. And it usually happens after some really embarrassing, horrible thing happened in the previous election. Uh, so in the Princeton case, it was, uh, it, not, to, not to demean them, they, they really tried to do the right thing, but there were some allegations that somebody in the previous government who had a friend running for the next election had found out about the results, partial results, early. And uh, there was talk of a recount because people were weirded out by the results. And the person opposed the recount. And then it came to light that he opposed the recount knowing that his friend was in the lead. And that didn't look very good. Not clear if that was the reason or if there was some actual, actual problems. But the point is, there was clearly all the data on the back end. And some people had the rights to see everything. Um, and uh, 
there's another university where another mini scandal is potentially causing them to look at something like Helios. So let me tell you a little bit about the work at the Université Catholique de Louvain with uh, uh, Olivier de Marneuf, Olivier Pereira, and Jean-Jacques Iscater, who did a, an enormous amount of work to adapt this to that setting. One of the important things they did was uh, send out signed PDFs to people with their uh, usernames and passwords, and then signed PDFs to people with their vote confirmation number so that there was an actual uh, non-repeatable trail of votes being cast. And if the entire system failed, the voter could come back with that signed PDF saying, hey, what happened to my vote? Um, that didn't, didn't have to, it was never necessary, but it was good that it was in place. This is the modified uh, uh, user interface they built in French. Uh, and uh, with the sample question, this is not the actual question. Uh, the nice thing is that we had verifiers for Helios. When you, when you prepare your ballot and you break it open in the, in the Benelo challenge, you get a, a chunk of text that you have to verify and make sure that that is a proper opening of a ballot. So we had three different universities that were running independent verifiers for that. There was UCL, there was Harvard, and there was a university in France so that you could basically have it checked in three different places and pick the one you trusted the most. So this is the Harvard version of the ballot verifier where you could go and paste your ballot, click check, and in your browser the entire verification would run. And the point is the code was delivered by Harvard, um, so maybe you were happier that that was independent from the code being delivered by UCL. This was covered in the press. It was a lot of fun. Actually, it was on Belgian national television. Uh, and uh, it, the, the new president of the university was elected by Helios, the one that's currently, uh, currently sitting there. The most fun tidbit of that experience is that in the first round, the leader was two votes short of winning out of 5,000 votes. And there was no, con there, nobody contested that. You know, they could have said, oh, you probably lost two ballots somewhere in there, I already won, right? But all the votes were there to look at. There was no doubt that, uh, you know, there, there was no extra votes to be found. Now, maybe the system cheated a couple of voters somehow and those voters didn't check their, uh, their ballots. It's possible, but it's extremely unlikely. Um, so that was the fun tidbit, the fact that two votes short out of 5,000, and you know, there was a third party auditor, nobody felt the need to argue that. Uh, it would have been uh, more interesting if in the second round, the, the, second, the other person had won, but it was the leader who eventually won. So you know, maybe that's not quite as interesting as it could have been. You know, for the voting, the, the problem with if you're a voting system programmer is you kind of want these systems to, to go in odd directions and maybe be very stressful because that's when your system performs the best. It's not so good for people who actually want to see the election happen smoothly, of course. So. Uh, the most interesting lesson, and this is a comment that uh, was mentioned to me earlier, um, there's an intuition that if you provide an avenue for people to complain, then they will complain. And then they will deny, basically mount a denial of service against you by complaining. And I was pretty convinced that we were gonna see some of that and we were worried about that and we had a help desk and we were you know, manning the, well, I wasn't manning the phones, I was, you know, I guess, third level support. We were, we were making sure, you know, we're on the lookout for people complaining. Uh, the in most interesting lesson is that people will complain whether you provide a system for complaining or not. <laughs> the difference is when you have the data and the votes are encrypted, and you don't hesitate you, to look at it because you're, you're not violating anybody's privacy by looking at the detailed logs of what IP connected to the server at what time and did what actions since the vote's encrypted. Uh, you can easily counter these claims. So there was one person who tried to vote, uh, sorry, who had failed to register because you had to register two weeks before. But the morning of the election, tried to access the registration site. We had the logs, right? Uh, failed because registration had been closed for two weeks, then tried to access the voting site, failed because this person was not registered, and then sent this inflammatory email saying, I am registered, I know I'm registered, and uh, you know, I've been registered for two weeks and I tried to vote today and your system failed me. And then they responded with the logs and said, doesn't look like you were registered because you tried to register this morning. And that was the end of that complaint. <laughs> so, 
the, it, this was unexpected. The very interesting lesson is that if the data is properly encrypted in the browser before it hits the server, then you can, you can do all the data mining you want on that data to make sure that things are going okay, to actually check when something goes wrong, and to address it if it happens. So that was surprising, and it was actually it was a very nice surprise. So that was UCL, very successful. They, are, they already ran another election using Helios that I don't have any data on yet, but uh, a smaller election that went well. And now they're undergoing a massive effort to adapt this for their student elections, which are much more complicated. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. So I want to tell you very briefly about Princeton, and then I want to show you a demo. <coughs> Princeton was going to be kind of a no-brainer election. It was going to run. I didn't think I was going to have anything interesting to say about it. Right? It's just a student election. Somebody got elected, fine. But something really interesting happened. Um, the election lasted three days. And there was an email at the beginning that said, OK, you can vote now. And there was an email in the middle that said, hey, don't forget to vote. There were two people running for president. One was a sophomore, one was a junior. The sophomore suddenly realized at the halfway point that almost none of his friends had received the Im reminder email. But all of his junior friends had received the reminder email. So he sends out this alarmed message saying, sophomores didn't get this email. And the response he gets from the administration is, well, I mean, maybe it got spammed. You know, what can we do about it? We sent out this email to everybody. What do you, what do you want us to do? So he said, you know, is, you know, Ben, is there anything you can do? Can you look at the data and say? I said, look, I'm going to look at it, but I honestly, I don't think I'm going to be able to tell you anything. So we graphed the data of people voting. At what time did they vote? And uh, sophomores are this uh, orangish color here. And that spike you see about two thirds of the way through is the reminder email going out. And I looked at this and I said, you know, it really does look like that sophomore spike is much, much smaller than the others. So I sent an email, I said, look, I'm eyeballing this, and I have no idea what the access patterns are, but I would say this is relatively clear evidence that sophomores didn't get the email. They, some of them got it. There's a spike, right? But they didn't get it in the same amount, in the same volume as everybody else. And if I had to eyeball it, I would say 10% got it. I mean, it's, you know, guess it. It's not eyeball it. It's really just, you know, pull it on my butt, basically. I would say 10%, right? Um, so this graph actually caused uh, folks in, in, the, in IT to say, OK, maybe there is an issue. And they went to their database system for their mailing aliases. And surprisingly enough, they found a database corruption in the alias for the sophomores. And they put the number at 15%. 15% of the sophomores got the email. So they, after that, they were able to send another reminder email so they urgently fixed the alias database, because usually it's only an overnight thing and it, the election would have ended. So they got somebody in the case, fixed the alias, sent out the email. And uh, the sophomore won by 40 votes out of 1,500. So that, again, very unexpected, but very interesting. So the most interesting lesson from here is voting is error prone. It doesn't matter what system you use. You're going to have all these odd failures. And in this case, it had nothing to do with the voting system. It was some database alias. But because we had the data, and because the vote was encrypted, I could go in. I didn't have the decryption keys. I could go in and do this auditing and figure this out and recover. And that, to me, you know, I'm a cryptographer, but I'm also a systems engineer. That, to me, is the strongest argument for this kind of system. You have the ability to recover from errors. If you assume there are no errors, you're just fooling yourself. Right? But if you can recover from them, then you've got a much better system. OK, so let's vote. This is the time when you can and you should have your laptop open. So uh, you should go to this URL. Sadly, if you're using IE8, you'll probably have to install Java. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry about that. It's the first of the open problems. Yes, we really? Huh? Really? Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. This is what you'll see if you go to that URL. So it's tinyurl.com slash mshelios. If you're using a portable device, you're definitely not, it's definitely not going to work for you. Uh, I, again, because of the Java requirement. That's the only thing that's standing in the way of, of uh, if you have Java support on your mobile device, then it, it might work, but it might be pretty slow. Um, <clears throat> so we're talking about mobile devices, and there was some fun news about how many people at Microsoft use iPhones recently. I decided to make an election 
lets you pick your favorite smartphone. So let's, so let's vote in this election. Uh, this is loading the election right now, and, uh, and it's going to tell me, pick your, sorry, tinyurl.com slash mshelios in one word. It should redirect you to this. Uh, re yes, I can. Uh, if I have a marker, yes, I have a marker right here. Okay. And uh, you will need, just before you start, I mean, you, don't, you won't need it when you start, but you will need it at the end, a Facebook or a Twitter account. So, you know, if you don't have that, uh, you can still prepare the ballot. That's actually important. Anybody can prepare a ballot without authenticating. That's the Benelo casting protocol. So you can try it. You can click. The, you can be the auditor, basically, who doesn't have the right to vote, but who has the right to audit. But if you want to cast the vote at the end, you're going to need a login. So, so this tells you you're going to select your options, encrypt your selection, and then submit your encrypted ballot. So let's start. Oh, I should have done something here. I should, um, I'm going to work offline. You don't see that because it's on this screen, but uh, I, guess, I guess I can show you by going to a tab and going to CNN and, it, what? <laughs> <laughs> Did it cache it? Yeah, what is this? 4.08 p.m. Eastern? Yeah, that's cached. There you go. So that's, uh, I guess you have to trust me that we're offline. <laughs> Good thing. You know you have to be nervous. And what do you mean? It's right up here. Bing. See? Okay. Do a search on my bottom. All right. So my favorite phone, uh, I really can't pick Google Android, right? That would just be, uh, that would just be, let's go with the Palm, right? That's, that's, uh, they, they got some bad financial news today. Let's be nice to them. Huh? So I will confirm this choice. I review my ballot. Question one, select your favorite phone, Palm Pre. I will confirm this and encrypt. Well, what's happening right now, again, I am offline. It's doing all of this in the browser. It's creating the encryption for every choice, a one or a zero. And it's generating the proofs that the, that ballot is done correctly. And if you're on a Windows machine, it will actually be much, much faster than this because Java on the Mac turns out to be very slow. So there you go. It'll probably be half a second if you're on Windows. So um, This gives you the ballot tracking number. This is the hash of your encrypted ballot. Now remember at this point, I have neither authenticated myself nor have I said whether I'm going to cast this or audit this. But the machine has committed to this ballot, which I can print or I can email to myself at this point in time. And now I can choose to either verify or I can go ahead to proceed to log in and cast. Just to show you what happens if you verify, uh, it, will op it will break this open and give you all the raw data, which I can copy and paste into the ballot verifier and I can go verify it. I've that's, you can try that if you'd like. Oh, I also have this option. This was suggested by Josh Benelow to uh, uh, counter the attack where your browser has been fully compromised and whatever verifier you go to, some malware is telling you, yep, this checks out, right? So I can post this audited ballot to the bulletin board and it will end up on the website where other people can audit it or I can use a different machine to go audit that this ballot with that receipt that I had was properly cracked open, basically. So that's a defense against your browser being, it's not a complete defense, but it's a partial defense against your browser being completely compromised by a virus. Right? So uh, what I mean by that is it's important to understand the, 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 the qualification here. If you copied that text and you put it in, your, in some text file and you later verified this, right? with any other program than your browser, you would probably find that somebody was trying to cheat you. But a lot of voters might only use that browser, and it's possible that that browser has been compromised. And if that's your only channel for, check, for casting and verifying, if you have no other channel, then corrupting that channel alone completely could be a problem. So this is about getting the vote into a different channel so you can verify it with a different browser. So according to the Benelow challenge, I cannot cast the ballot I've cracked open because if I do that, I can prove how I voted, right? I know the randomness of how I encrypted my ballot. So I have to encrypt this with different uh, randomness, which it will do now, and it will generate a different receipt. So that starts with uh, OJ, and I will go ahead to proceed to, <laughs> nice. This is the mistake you do when you're, when you're working offline. Let's see if I can try again. Uh, 
Yeah, okay, good. So at this point, here's my tracking number. And now I can either uh, connect with Facebook or sign in with Twitter. Um, I think I'll go with Facebook here. I think I'm already logged into Facebook, so it just comes, comes right back and says, you're Benedita, cast this ballot. Remember, my tracking number starts with OJE. When I cast this ballot on the server side now, it's verifying all the proofs that this ballot was properly put together, that you know, there's all, all sorts of stuff happening. It's done, and then for, for my safety, it's logged me out so that if somebody uses this computer again, they can't replace this vote. The very nice thing about these types of systems is that since we know which one is your vote, we can let you vote multiple times and just count the last ballot, right? So if you change your mind, you can come back and vote again, and that will replace your ballot with the new one. Or if you think the machine was doing something funky, you can go to a different machine and try again, and again, the, only your last ballot will count. So now we can go back to the election info. And hopefully some of you have been able to cast a vote. Let's go see the audit info over here. Uh, we can look at the audited ballots and see, I don't know if that was my, was that my receipt? Oh, you know why it didn't, it didn't work? I was offline. I tried to post my ballot to this, this thing, but I was offline, so, and it didn't warn me, so there's a bug. Somebody else posted this. That was not mine. Um, so we go back here. We'll go to the ballot tracking center, and uh, there's a few people who have voted. All right. There's mine, OJ, et cetera. There's Tom, and there's Leo. Uh, so that's somebody with, I think that's somebody with a Twitter account, and this is somebody with a Facebook account. Uh, since Facebook IDs are numbers and et cetera. So uh, I could tally this election, but maybe I'll let people vote a couple more times. I'll tell you very briefly how the tallying would work. Um, I think I have to, uh, first thing I have to do is I have to log in because as, as the Facebook user, I am the administrator for this election, which means that as the administrator for this Microsoft demo, I can now choose to compute the tally. If I do that, that will close the election and do the homomorphic computation. I don't, you know, I, I'm not, I don't use any cryptographic keys to do that. I just do the homomorphic sum of everything. So actually, I'll go ahead and do that just so you can see it. Um, I apologize to people who are trying to vote. You, you'll still be able to go through the process of preparing your ballot. You just won't be able to do the last step in casting. So I compute the tally here. It warns me, be careful. Nobody else will be able to cast a ballot. Um, it's actually, it's, all right, so it's doing this in batches for reasons that are not very important. Uh, it's done that, and now it's waiting for the trustees to decrypt. So I am the only trustee, because, you know, I want to know how you voted. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, here is the key right here. Uh, you only see the public part of it. I'm, I purposely set it up so you don't see the private thing, the private part of the key. Here is my... Um, Here's my link as trustee that I got by email to go to my trustee dashboard. And I get to the trustee dashboard, it says, I need, you know, we need to decrypt this. Uh, so I will go ahead and decrypt with my key. I will now copy my key, oops, copy my key into here. Now I could go offline again because, oh, crud, I displayed the private key for a fraction of a second on video. <laughs> uh, the first part here is it's going to generate the decryption factors in the browser. Again, not going over the network. This part is happening inside the browser, and it, and it displays the decryption factors for that trustee. And then those decryption factors then get posted to the, to the, to the website with a second click. So the first part can be offline, and the second part can be online. And then that's done. I go back to the election. I have to combine the decryptions. There's only one, but I still have to do it. Um, and it looks like iPhone, uh, MS Windows Phone 7, and I just make phone calls. Uh, <laughs> did, how, how did, did people, did, other, did more people vote while I was? Seven people. Uh, seven, oh, okay, so while I was clicking, other people voted. Okay, good. good, good. Sure huh? Sure sort of zero. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so prove it. Uh, so here's, here's how we prove it, right? We go to the, we verify the election tally uh, by going to this piece of, this is all static JavaScript. You could run this locally on your system or all sorts of other servers could make it available and using just the election ID, it's actually going to start downloading all the ballots and going to verify all of them individually. 
So I guess there were eight voters, and I think one of them didn't get a chance to you vote. Twice. I'm there twice with my Twitter account and with my Facebook account. Yeah, one of them I didn't use to vote. Uh, by the way, this election I set up with open registration so that anybody can go vote. But you could set up an election where there's first a registration phase, and then you close it, and then you trim it down for people who, like me, registered twice, and then you open the election. Or, so, or just a fixed database. Or a fixed database, yeah. So this is going through, and it's checking each vote that every choice that you that you voted, you know, it's a one or a zero in the inside the ciphertext so that they can be added up together. It's checking that everyone is properly formed and then at the very end it's checking that, that the, the tally is done correctly. Yeah. Does the president of UCL have any cloud or is it purely honorary? Sorry, say that again? Does the president of UCL have any cloud? The president of the university? Oh yeah. He does? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they, they, it's the president, it's not the student president. It's, no, the, it's like the president of the university. Well, the chancellor of, of Cambridge has no cloud whatsoever. Okay. So it's yeah, they have some decisions, you know, like major construction projects, decisions to merge with other universities or not. You know, it's, there's, there's definitely some stuff going on. All right. Um, and we are, it looks like, oh, I think we're done. Yeah, there's like one missing message at the end. But basically, if you look at every answer, every single one of them has been verified, including the I just make phone calls, which is apparently as popular as the iPhone to, to Apple's great despair. Um, okay. So... There we go. That is Helios and uh, some open problems. I'll throw out a few. Uh, this is not really a deep research problem, although it, it can be. Java is a big pain in the butt for a lot of people. They don't want to trust the entire JVM to download into their browser. I understand that. We're looking at ways to make this efficient enough to run in pure JavaScript. If you know people on the IE JavaScript team and you want to convince them to add big num support, inside JavaScript, that would be fantastic. I think it would be good for more than just Helios. Uh, I think there are some interesting research problems in, if we want to continue this on the web in having some way for one site to somehow certify that it's the code you're loading from another site hasn't changed, right? Some, some hash that this code hasn't changed in some way so that, if, so that there's a little bit more assurance that this booth that we're all verifying is really the same booth for everybody. You know, we're not doing IP address based. Well, this person probably will never check their vote, so we can give them the, the, the bad booth code and such. Um, it would be nice to give a choice to voters to do the truly interactive proofs the way that Andy has proposed in some of his schemes, not just the cut and choose. Like, I want to verify this vote I'm actually casting, not the ones I don't get to cast. It'd be very nice if we could do single transferable vote, although I share Ron's uh, 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 preference for other voting schemes. There are a lot of people who want to use single transferable vote for, uh, for their elections, in particular open source communities and boards who tend to be elected with STV. So it'd be nice to support that at some point. And then the deepest issue is, uh, is, is, the, is the sort of... Uh, the deepest issue that's much broader than Helios, uh, but that I thought I would introduce anyways, and I hinted at this morning, is the concept of enforced privacy over. And it's part of what's driving the research behind Helios, which is uh, maybe we should be making sure that in the context where people are doing remote voting, at least we've got the best audibility we can get, because maybe that's going to happen whether we like it or not. So that's it. So I guess we're discussing, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in the examples that you gave, the, the voting population who was interacting with it really had only one in, or, uh, one ballot style, if you will. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so there was no need to get to identify the person before they got their ballot. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but in an environment where you have people who, in one part of the county, they've got one ballot style. Another part of the county, they've got another. Yes. How would you? What concept? How would that work? Yeah. So I, I, the way that would work, and it doesn't support it right now, but the way it would work uh, with a little bit of additional programming is, as a voter, you would have to start by saying, "I am in this county," not saying who you are, but you would select your county. You would get that ballot style, and when it comes time to submit it, there would be, in the unfortunate case that they selected the wrong county, you would tell them. So sorry, <laughs> uh, this, you can't cast this ballot because it's the wrong county. You could potentially do things like, well, cast the contest for which I'm still eligible anyways and, and narrow the ballot down to that. 
or you could give them the option to, you know, but go. But it's trickier than that because, for example, if you're King County, yeah. you live in King County, you could have uh, th there's 300, 400 different ballot styles. Oh, right. So, so well, so how do you decide? Is there like a zip code? Which one of those ballot styles does that person get? Well, I, mean, I, I guess it depends on your on the rules you have for assigning people to ballot styles. It, 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 is it are they is it by zip code? Is it by address? Is it, well, it's 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 more complicated because it depends upon where the the jurisdictional boundaries like okay. the water sewer district and so, so probably overlap. right. So probably the best thing to do would be to show them a, a Bing map. <laughs> a Bing map where, where the areas are laid out, and they would click on the region that where they're at without actually specifying their address, and then that would send them to the right ballot style. That's the best. Uh, uh, unless they point to just across the street, which has a different ballot style than this side. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. I mean, it, you could be a little smart about it, and and you could say, uh, you know. Uh, click in the general area where you're at, and then if it's clear, then just give them that. And if it's not clear, just say which side of the street are you on. But th that would be an interesting challenge because it would probably come very close to identifying them, especially if they happen to point exactly where they live. So, would it be uh, any thought given to like multiple channel approach? Like one channel they get what ballot style they are, and the other channel they put in what that ballot style. Absolutely, is. I think that the voter would have trouble believing that those channels are truly separate. But I think if it came down to such a complex algorithm, then that's exactly the way it would have to be done, which is you go to a site, you enter your exact address, you're told what your county is, and then you're told to go to this other site where you now pick your county and, and go, basically. Yes, I think that's probably, given the complexity you're describing, that's probably what it would have to end up being. Yeah. Yes? So I really like the point about recovering from failures, yeah. uh, because I was part of a student election, I guess, 10 years ago now, yeah. where the, um, the disk stopped accepting rights halfway through the election. <laughs> These are things that happen, right? Like, there's just nothing you can do. Um, yeah, and it turned out that the, the software exhausted the number of I nodes on the disk. Well, that's, that's a rare one. That is a rare one. Uh, but so what I like, what I wanted to ask you is, have you thought about like if like the central tabulator, where all those things are stored, if that goes down? Yeah. So it seems like you could maybe partially recover by having people have their browsers send the votes back again. Yeah. But that, or, or you could distribute it with a few different servers independently, and you post it to three out of the five servers, and you know, you're, you're, then you're, you go from there. I, I think that those solutions for robustness would be very good. The solution for robustness right now is it's stored on Google App Engine, and we hope Google doesn't go down, and so far it's worked okay, but every now and then they do go down, right? And right. so, um, so it, it's unlikely that, the thing, yeah, it's, if they go down, I guess, at least you know you've got some support staff <laughs> trying to bring all of Google back up. But, uh, but I think you're right that it would be nice to have one at Google, one at Microsoft, one at somewhere else so that you've got true robustness. And, and another just thing that actually happened was uh, the clock was set wrong and so the election ended early. Nice. Have you got any thoughts about how you would detect something like that? That's a good switch? question. Oh, well, one thing I should point out, um, actually maybe I can just show you really quickly. Um, Actually, I, I don't really want to show you this because it, it's, it would advertise an election that I should not be advertising. Uh, okay, well then if it's okay, I will do it. Uh, so, so if, uh, so what I want to show you here is there's, there's one election that's been run recently where we had an independent election monitoring system run by the team at UCL. Uh, this is entirely different code. They rewrote all the crypto. There's no common code at all between the two things. And what they do here in this auditing is they're constantly downloading the data from the Helios server and they're redisplaying it. They're redisplaying the result. They're redisplaying the verification of everything. And if the election suddenly closed, then they could probably raise a flag. And we're hoping, we're working through some of the politics, but we're hoping to open source this soon so that anyone could run a Helios verifier. This is, this is effectively like a sentinel, like watching the system and, double, and reproducing all of the checks and verifications that you know, in a political election, every political party could have one of these running, basically. Yes? Do you know, it seems there's an interesting discrepancy between um, registrations and votes. In which, in the here? Or? Yeah, 15, you know, roughly 25% of voters. Oh, well, in this case, we had a pre-set pre list of voters that okay. we registered. 
And so what this just means is that there's 25, 20 to 25% participation rate. That's okay, what it means. It wasn't 1,500 people registered for the election no, and no. then only... No, no, no. It, they were pre-registered by the system. Yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's like the, the principle of the UCL election. Right? Yeah. Eligible yeah. versus actual. Okay. But what you're touching upon is like the, one of the little practical things that makes it so hard to build a system like this is that there, there's cases where it's open registration. There's cases where you have a database of voters before. There's cases where you want, you don't, you know, the Princeton case was actually very challenging because of all the, the uh, student privacy protections. We actually couldn't get a list of voters delivered to us from the, uh, the registrar's office. We had to send them to the Princeton login system where they would log in, and only then would we find out if they were freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, et cetera. Uh, so there's all sorts of odd things. Whenever you try to implement one election, you find out this election looks almost nothing like the previous one. So, yeah. Any other questions? Or I can bring back the open problems here. It's, but or we can stop too. Well, actually, my list of open problems is completely covered by yours. OK, <laughs> awesome. Um, what do people think about this one? I don't. I, this I was expecting some uproar about this, or but everybody seems to be like, yeah, maybe. No. Yeah. Explain the way you position it. You said, look, the thing that we have in online, where people make this choice, they know they're not going to get coercion freeness. They know there's some lack of privacy. If you had said, oh, enforced privacy is over for all voting everywhere, even in places that don't do vote by the mail, I think you get more. Than that. So let me make it more controversial then. Um, is it's possible that. It, even in in-person elections, given the technology we have, we all have camera phones. We you know, can all stream it live on the internet. I mean, do we? Is this is this going to be in ten years? Is this going to be true for all voting for all elections? Yeah. Partial answer is a, is a legal system. I know that in the U.S. you can ask questions about what, happened, what happens in the jury. In the U.K., it shall be contempt of court to inquire about what happened in the jury room. You make it a criminal offense to ask such questions, right? And to keep records, and well, the mafia may not be deterred, but lots of political parties will. Mm -hmm. You don't go, risk going to jail just to get your man voted in. Vote, vote buying is already a criminal offense. True, it still exists. Yeah, but uh, you make all steps of the way criminal, right? No records to be kept, and all that. Yeah, I mean, and basically, you don't need you don't need a, a specific voting precinct. This corner you stand in, with two people watching, but nobody can see what you write, can be a, can be a place you can vote in private. You well, mark a piece of paper and close the envelope. Right. Where do you stand? Well, but uh, you know, ten years from now, I'm guessing that a live streaming camera phone implanted in your glasses is not really out of the question, right? I mean, it's already. I'm, oh, I got a phone call. Hold on. This is a small camera. Right? Have you been? Secretly, you didn't need to. There are other cameras filming. Here today. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> the smallest camera in this room now. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting that you say that. Everybody yeah. turns to David. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 I, my, my comment on that particular question is that there are folk who voluntarily surrender privacy because they want to get the vote counted. Um, and again, it goes back to the Yurikawa vote type voters who will send a, uh, a fax ballot in return and they uh, actually sign a waiver in Washington that says that, that, that they waive their right to privacy. Um, now, I will comment that we don't count that ballot. All it, all it does, it, it, we, we don't count a ballot until we get the original physical one. Uh, so the only function it it serves really is proof that they cast their ballot on time. Do you check that they match? That they are consistent? Um, I don't think we do. Okay. Uh, you know, I don't think so. Which one do you Requirement. Count? Well, the phys actual physical ballot is the one that's counted. Okay. okay. So that that could be an interesting defense against against that. Um, I, I mean, the thing. So I, in in Massachusetts, when I was an elect a poll worker, I was a poll worker at a different polling location than my own. Um, I said, how how am I going to vote? Uh, and I said, can I, can I absentee vote? Because it was pretty far. And I asked, and they said, no, actually, that's not a valid reason to be, to be an absentee voter. So there are some states where I think there's still uh, different philosophies, but they're still enforcing it. It's not a choice. You don't get to waive your privacy if you want to. You have to have a valid, approved reason. And apparently being a poll worker in a different precinct was not even, that was, even that was not a valid reason. So I had to, in my 15-minute break, I had to cab it over and, and vote and cab it back. So. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks.